Okay. Um, so uh, the biggest thing today, kind of wanted to go through a couple of things, but mostly, and I'll record this uh, or use Eagle's recording, which is great, so we can put it on the the little thing for everyone. Um, the biggest thing that most people have an issue with is like nailing a strategy down, uh, even with the indicators, even with you know confirming trades and, and like all the different stuff we have uh, price action wise that really help us. Most people still have like you know they need structure and rules essentially, and like that's the only way to trade. A lot of people I know, um, and that's how everyone starts out, is that you don't know what you don't know, and most people will eventually start at the same point, which is. I'm just trying some new indicators or I'm trying some new strategy and, you know, not understanding the markets behind it, not understanding why things do what they do. And then when it goes bust, it flushes them out of the market and then they go try something else. And then the next thing and the next thing. Um, when realistically setting like my biggest thing here is I'll just share like my strategy and like in the way that I trade when I take about when I essentially put myself into positions and then, based off of you know higher time frame lower time frame that type of stuff because there's a little bit of difference as far as allocation uh but the rules for, for risk reward and all that stuff are about the same you know i tell everyone three to one i usually do four to one or higher uh you know what you're risking risking is assets like what is your total capital at risk in a single trade um i've done down to like 0.5 percent up to like three or four percent depending on market conditions but Generally speaking, I'll just go through like what I think is the most important stuff. Uh, it kind of like as a base, as a starting point. So um, yeah, so it, overall, and I'll do this, to just talk about general strategy, and then I'll, I'll have a little section that I wrote about altcoins because we've already done that before, but it's good to refresh. So when you're developing the strategy, the most important thing, it has to be repeatable, which means that it has to be based off of conditions that can be met multiple times. It has to be based off of a consistency where you're able to take positions. Like if you're able to take one position in a trade every three months, that's not a viable system because you're not exposed to the market. You're not making money. You're essentially just doing something every 90 days, like, a, like you're going to a casino or something. Conversely, you don't want to be taking 90 to 100 tr different trades a day. Um, that's not good for you. It's not over trading is just as is more dangerous essentially than under trading. Uh, and as traders, you are already you know, risk averse. You are in, willing to lose money in a, in, a, in a financial market, which that's the underlying thing. So when you're developing the strategy, like I said, it has to be re repeatable. That's the most important thing. Uh, rules that I use for trading. Number one, risk reward must be four to one. to first profit target. Uh, so this is a bit of a weird one for most people. When they think about risk reward, they think like, oh, but I want to you know, be able to set up something where I can take multiple risk rewards and I can do all this different stuff. It's like, well, the problem is your golden ratio is that. It's, it's you know, four to one. Four to one on a risk reward ratio. And you're doing this to your first profit target. And the reason you're doing this to your first profit target is that you're now making it harder for you to fail to get to your first profit target. Because what happens at your first profit target, what's some other things? It's like moving your stop loss up, right? Move, being able to lock in profit, being able to take 10, 20, 30%. So uh, your risk reward must be four to one, your first profit target. That is a rule. That's something that I always stick by. Uh, two, I think for me, it's um, max, max capital at risk per at any time it's 2%. I'm, I can live with 2%. It's not great if you lose it, but it's not catastrophic either. Uh, what this means is, is it doesn't mean that I have one trade that is essentially open and then, you know, the stop loss is still at the starting point and then I go open another thing and another thing. I'm talking about at all times when I'm looking and taking positions and trades, I, I will not expose more than 2% of my capital. So there's things that you can do to get around this. For example, let's say I wanted to take a long on Bitcoin, right? And I long the bottom, right? I got a perfectly long, long 15.5 and the regain and all that stuff, right? 
the moment that your stop loss, right? Your stop loss, let me just turn this back to you can see it a little easier, goes in front of your entry point. Right? So you're moving your stop loss up above your entry. That means the risk to that trade, to your risk to your capital, is zero. So that's a really important thing. So what this means is that when I'm doing this, when I'm taking multiple positions, as soon as my stop loss goes into profit, that means that I have zero risk on my capital. And now I have another, two, I can now go allocate 2% of my remaining account into positions. Okay. And what this is, is that you're protecting yourself from like multiple liquidations. And most people will do this all the time, right? They'll be allocated and, oh, well, you know what? I only have a small account, so I'll use 25% of it. Or, well, I'm on low leverage, so I'll use 70% of my account. Um, if you're manually trading, uh, even if you're botting and you're doing that, it's not an effective long-term strategy because two bad hits, like if you two bad full stopped out losses that, that lose your entire, you know, amount of that capital and it'll take you you know you have to gain essentially double your account from that point that's why like what people don't realize is like well if i lose my account down to only 10 percent, right if i don't lose everything and i only have 10 percent of my let's say i start with a grand and i only have a hundred dollars left because i lost everything i only have 10 percent of my account you know what i have to do now with that account to make break even i have to 9x that account nine times more money in that account and I have to make it just by doubling up and doubling up and doubling up. So like I said, you you need to protect your capital at all times. And if you're not doing that, you're, you're doing something wrong. Um, so that's you know, back to capital risk at any time is 2%. Stop loss moved to profit as soon as possible. Now, with that, a lot of people will, you know, if price is barely above the entry, they, they start moving their stuff up. What I usually do is I usually move my stop loss to a little under, you know, break even or round about my entry at the, first pro uh, at the first profit target. And then by the second profit target, it's like must be in profit by the second PT, right? So that's, that's the way I look at it, right? I move my stop loss up you know, as I've made my first profit target, and then I move it into profit by at least by the time I hit my second profit target. Okay. And the reason for that, again, is that you need to make sure that you're, you're profiting at all times. Like cash flow positive is the name of the game. And it wrecks, it ruins most people's stuff. Uh, they focus on the things that don't really matter. They don't understand the fact that if you're not moving stuff into profit, you're not constantly taking something off the top you're essentially just gambling because what you're doing is you're going all in on a position and then it starts pulling back a bit. And you're like, oh, I'm just going to hold it. I'm not going to close it and starts retracing more. Oh, but this is the bird's supposed to bounce. Now you're playing the emotional game. Instead of just being strict and regimented with it, which is like, we went here, I take 20%. You go there, you take 30%. Um, another thing that I use that's really specific is uh, when planning trades, I have at least three PTs. So at least three profit targets, that's an important one. And then another one that I use is um, take profit at every PT. It's why it's called a profit target. My example is that I usually take about 20 to 25% on the first profit target. So again, you need to be taking profits at your positions. If you're setting profit targets in a trade, if you're planning it correctly, you have to have multiple profit targets. If you're just market smashing in and market smashing out, yes, you can do that if you're down on like the one minute and the three minute, but that is very, very difficult for most people. And most people get absolutely destroyed all the time frames because they think they're smarter than the guys who have six figure systems uh, with macros pre-programmed -pre into their keyboards and stuff like that, you know, who have like bots that they can smash a button and it'll chase entry or it'll chase limit exit, just stuff that we don't have access to. You can't essentially compete with those guys with the market makers on the low time frames because what these guys do is 
they don't they can't the market's too liquid for them to massively affect the market anymore but what they can do is they can restrict price by putting in orders that hold price in a certain place or hold price in a you know up to the upside or the downside but that's usually enough to liquidate most people because if you're on the low time frames you're also using high leverage also with leverage leverage is not your friend right respect it what I usually do with leverage on most of my positions, 10x is 10x is, works for me, right? Now, the reason I say 10x is that what I can do then with that 10x of my account, you you can there's a essentially there's a couple things if you want to Google them, you can look at uh, exposure charts where it says like, well, if I have a hundred dollars, you know, and I only want to allocate two percent of that, right? Two percent of a hundred dollars is two dollars. And then if I'm using then at a 10x leverage, I, my trade value, right, at 10x is essentially $20. Now, that doesn't mean that you have 20% of your account exposed. You still have that 2% of your account exposed at a higher leverage. So what you want to do with these positions is to make sure some important things like, well, in relation to my stop loss, is my liquidation level, you know, higher than my where I plan my trade with my stop loss that's an important thing I generally whenever I played a you know trade plan or, or plan a trade I always use isolated margin I never use cross because now I'm essentially exposing my entire account if you're using cross so I'll put that in there as a rule right never cross margin only isolated so you never use cross margin you only use isolated or you risk exposing more than two percent of your capital essentially a cross margin is in comparison is that if you take an isolated position for the guys who aren't savvy really with well i'll just explain it anyways because it's an easy one but what you're now doing if you're in cross is you're exposing your entire account. Your entire account will be used to fund the, the maintenance fees and the margin fees if you get margin called on that position. So you can liquidate an entire account very, very, very quickly. It's important to know how much you're exposed. And if you are more exposed than not, you should look at de-risking. So this is a couple of things I think kind of like get people to the starting point, essentially. Uh, there's one last thing I kind of want to mention, which is, the trade, the trade is still valid if you're stopped out, but not if it, uh, not if if uh, price action invalidates it. So what that means is, is that the reason we have these high risk rewards, four to one. This is what I use, right? Like I, I three to one's a minimum, four to one's what usually I use. Four to one, five to one. The higher, the better. What it does by having these things out is that price can essentially go against you, stop you out, and then you have a chance to re-enter. Then maybe it stops you out again, and then maybe you get it on like the third try, and you can still make profit on that position. And that's the entire thing, which is that you want multiple chances in case you get stopped out. Some guys will go to very loose stop losses. I don't like that because usually if you have a very loose stop loss, like a very low stop loss, what you end up actually having is a risk reward that isn't four to one. and the price action is probably invalidated the trade if it's hitting it already. So when you're talking about the actual valid validation of trades, I'll kind of just go in lower, just look at some local price action stuff, right? So essentially here, like we, we all know where we are on the chart, right? This hasn't changed at all. Uh, it's been in the sa same range. We're still looking for those higher lows from the major blocks. We're still getting the essentially the long continuations from like 29. Uh, K going back of the upside. We've done some good structural testing today. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on that actually looks pretty decent. So if we're looking for positions as an example, right, what are we seeing currently? Right, we're seeing some some holds, some failures at structure, some price action levels. We can use a lot of things, you know, to our favor. We can use some of the like the multi-volume delta. What do we see here? Okay, well, price rejected perfectly at the swing. And we also have bullish volume out of position for where we trace them back down. And, you know, it hasn't broken down yet, but this is, again, these are great things for it's like, okay, well, the trend's up, it's starting to fail. And now we're seeing essentially a, a lower time frame swing fail, right? 
What do we have below us? We've got some uh, point of control. We've got some daily opens. If I'm looking along this thing, what's my first invalidation, right? If I'm just going to pop up a long position in here, where's my first invalidation? If I'm trying to long the daily open. Well, if it loses it, comes and stops me out, and then bearishly backtests it, right? The moment it bearishly backtests that and then breaks the low, uh, even if it bearishly backtests, it can still gain above. You don't know just because it's tapping it. You're not trying to short the loss. You short the confirmation, right? What's the confirmation? You're making a new low of the low you already created. So you've now confirmed the trend of the downside, and you've broken the, the chance to go back up. So you're looking to re-enter this position until you do that. So what's your invalidation? Well, your invalidation isn't always a level. It's not like if price goes here, I, my, the longs are banned, essentially. The longs are banned or the shorts are banned if it breaks the price action structure. If you're losing levels, your first instinct should be not to long because you're now breaking structure and going down. If you start breaking levels and going down, your first priority is like, well, okay, wait a second. We've broken the trend to the upside. We haven't done it yet, not in the current price action, right? But when it happens, and it always will eventually, everything will break and everything will gain. What happens? Well, then you look for that continuation failure, right? If we break down, you want to see the first bounce, and then you want to see a failure that effectively breaks back to the downside. So that's, you know, stuff like that, that invalidates a long position. If price just breaks down, smacks the July Q3, and then higher lows it back on the daily, the long is still valid. But if we get a bearish retest on that, essentially the level that we're looking at, that's essentially what you're looking for, right? You're looking for that essentially move to, to say, hey, the longs are invalidated because we've lost the, the top level from this structure. And then we've lost the level we didn't want to lose, which is the daily open. So now you've got like, you've broken two pieces of structure and you've broken the upside trend to the upside by making a lower high, a lower low and a lower high consecutively, right? So now you've essentially, by doing that, you're making a series of trend changes where you're not gaining levels, you're now losing levels. And is that a safer position to essentially short than trying to short the highs? Absolutely. You now have confirmation. And what does that tell you also? Well, if that's my confirmation, of a short, that's also my invalidation for a short. So if we break down here, we lose the trend of the upside, and then we come back down, what, what's the potential long? Well, if we gain the level back to the upside, right? And that's the entire mentality of how we tr do price action and trading, and that's using all the indicators and stuff to help us out. Because what we're ev effectively able to do by looking at it from that perspective of uh, invalidation or regaining or, lo or losing is that you're, the more you do that, the less you actually care about which direction the market goes. Like you shouldn't care. You shouldn't wake up in the morning like, oh, I wonder what happened with the charts. Are we dumping? Like, I don't care. You know, I have long-term profiles for like just accumulating massive amounts of Bitcoin. Great. That's something I'm doing on the side. With my trades, what's an easy level for me to essentially look for a failure? Look, where's some local structure, right? Where are we failing? We're failing at the four-hour swing. It's also the one-hour. It's also a lot of important structure. Right. That's obviously the, the 30.8. We've had that level in place on the USCT chart for like a month. Why? Because that's the freaking level. There's nothing else up here. So when you're seeing those failures and you're saying like, OK, well, we're testing all we're supposed to test. If we gain that, that's the continuation up. But we're looking like we're now getting at the high of the local structure. And then you've got some stuff to the left of you, which created some massive, massive, you know, supply zone effectively. and do you want to short yet? The higher risk plays are always trying to short the tops where they're supposed to fail. They are supposed to fail there. That's exactly where it was supposed to pull back earlier this morning. And you would have caught a nice, like, what is that? A $200 or not even like a hundred dollar pullback. Okay. So it's not the, not the greatest trade, but it's a good enough for a potential scalp. And you're starting to see some structural failures, right? You've got some indication that there's some sluggishness, some volumes, a little bit out of position, but not really. This four hours still in position. So there's no break of level. You're still looking for the trend to continue until it doesn't. And that's the whole thing, right? This is like, like the whole mentality of why we even call ourselves trend masters, because we know the trend is up here, right? We're looking for the long to continue. We're always looking to long levels as we gain them because we are gaining levels. And only when we break levels are we then looking to potentially short. Why? What's the condition? You have to have a trend change. 
And that's that's the simplest part about it is that when you set up your trade plans, you can't also say in there, unless you want to, it's like, you know, if you're setting a trade plan, right? And just say invalidation of the long is bearish retest of daily open. There you go. Does that take five seconds? Cool. Good good trade plan. Is the risk reward great? It's not awesome, but let's keep it tight, right? Just in case. There's some nice four hour structural levels right in here. So let's keep it tight. And then in case we get stopped out, we can re enter, right? And that's the easiest way to do it. And with entries too, sometimes if I'm looking for initial bounce, what am I, what's my first instinct? Essentially to, to front run it just a little bit. Uh, just in case the the price kind of goes close to it, but not all the way. And some of the easy things that you can use to help yourself if you're trying to get a larger position in play and you have the time to limit them. If you're saying, let's say I got $100 that I want to put in a position in a long, right? If you have the time, why would you put all of your money in one spot, right? As far as that's the limit order. Instead, why wouldn't you just split that into five pieces and then you put little chunks of $20 trades in a long with your average, right, being your stop, being four to one of your stop loss. So what this does, and this is just a little example of, you know, spread entries, essentially, is that if price comes back down and only tax the daily open, I might only get $60 allocated, right? Because those are my this one twenty, forty, sixty dollars $60 in a long position. But now where's my entry? Now my effective entry level's here. That's the average of my entry between my positions. So now what you're able to do is you're able to get more efficient entries on positions, even if you're not fully filled. So again, it's a nice way to kind of de-risk yourself if you're into that. It's definitely worth a look into, but just as a little suggestion. But um, yeah. And then again, like if that's the long that you want to see as a potential continuation, what's the other obvious long? Well, if you have a bullish regain of 30.8, you're obviously going back the upside, right? What's the downside? Let's see if we can find a potential short, right? So we have a, oh God, it's a massive one. So we have a potential short on the daily open. Where do we want to target? What's the first major target if we have the failure of the level? Well, for this to happen first, we know that we want it to break down and test the structures and then barely retest the levels. That's the first chance to maybe enter. And then by the time we cross that, then you have to look at a market entry. Is this a good risk reward to essentially short that level if you're, having your daily open as your uh, as your stop loss. No, it's a too low risk reward. But what I can do is on the initial bounce, right? It's coming back up. I can try to short this with a very tight stop, right? Targeting the July Q3 with a nice, very tight stop. Maybe even a little bit more than that. It's a bit wild, right? If I don't get filled, maybe it front runs me. I can then re-enter the position lower as it crosses and creates a low, creates a new low. So this is like two ways you can kind of protect yourself. If you're keeping your risk rewards high, like if you're keeping them four to one, five to one or whatever, you can you think of it as two separate attempts to enter the position. So if you if you get skipped, right, and your in your risk reward ratio goes from, you know, what is it, four point eight and now you bring it back down to like three something, three Eh, it's not the best one. It's not something that I really look at, but it's still something you can do as far as like a position or at the worst case, you could just tighten your stop up to make sure you're hitting that four mark. So even there, that's still a valid potential short. And you're still able to essentially get stopped out on it several times before it's failed. What's the invalidation then if you do that and you break down the low, you caught the short going back to the July Q3, right? What's the, what's the invalidation of the short? Well, you got to gain the level that you short that you longed, right? Or the, you have to gain the level that you shorted, and that that means then the shorts invalidated. So all you're doing at all times is that when you're looking at charts, at position, at trades, everything essentially goes from the mentality of if we if we do this, then I do that. If we break this structure down, we are potentially changing the trend of the downside. If we're failing stuff, then I'm looking essentially to short. If we're in an upside trend, gaining, like we talked about on uh, when, I, when I did the post on Monday, essentially, um, talking about the gain of level to continue the perfect test that we got at 31K, which was awesome, like literally straight to 31, and then fail back down. And then we've been gaining structure, right? We're holding levels. 
to go up, what does that mean? We're gaining, we're going higher. So the continuation, even though we're in a range, right? We know we're in a range. You're still thinking, well, as long as we're gaining levels, we're, we're going higher. And that's the whole thing. What happens if we start breaking levels? We do this. Like, like obviously, if you lose that, where are you going? You're going back to the weekly open. There's nowhere else to go, right? But what has to happen? You have to lose the levels that you gained to go back to the downside. And, and that's just like the hardest thing for most people essentially is to change their own, is to flip their bias because then they get upset and they get frustrated and emotional. Oh, I'm, I lost that trade. Damn it. I'm just going to keep looking for the long so I win one. Don't ever think like that. You know, it's all about validation. If, if the if the trade is still valid, the trade is still valid. It's that simple. There's nothing else to, to think about, essentially. And how do you how do you check your bias? Like I always say on the streams, invert your chart. What happens if we lose this low? Where are we going? We're going back to test structure. We're testing much lower and potentially even where we could potentially break out into new highs because everything to the left of us has been tested, right? All tested. We're at the level to fail. We've already tested all of that as well. We've got the very tippy top of that that hasn't, that, you know, probably hasn't been tested all the way. I mean, just barely, right? So the priority is still to the downside. What do we want to test if we go back to the upside? Probably want to test here because everything else is tested. You could go stop off at 30.4 and then go to 30, 30K. But where's the priority? The priority is down. If you want to see gains, you wait for the level gains. And then you can use stuff on lower time frames. Okay, we're building up some liquidity. We see a nice, you know, the nice trend to the downside, right? What's the, what are we looking at? We're looking at the buildup of long liquidity going back up and potentially to squeeze to the downside until we gain it back. What's the first chance of taking some of this major liquidity, getting access to it, essentially, going back through to the beginning of the week? We've got to gain the levels, right? Then that provides the fuel for that move. So that's what you're looking for when you're planning your trades. So at the end of the day, the easiest way if you're not in positions is to isolate levels that are important in the overall structure. Um, and by the way, let me just take... Let me just flip over here because we're about to have the uh, data release. Do you guys hear me fine, by the way? Just checking. Okay, cool. All good. Yeah, we're how we, all the inflation data should be coming in right now. Uh, any second now. Uh, right about now. There we go. Big pop. Let's see what happens. If you see the failures, where do you want to see? If we see the nuke down, where are we going? Probably down to 30K. But again, we're moving up. The data comes in. Actual is lower than expected. Actual inflation is lower than expected. Actual inflation in your ears is lower than expected. So is that good? Yes. Let me just check on uh, the calendar on the other one as well. So again, these things are good for the markets. They're bad for the dollar. That's the way to look at it, essentially. Does that mean we have to go up? No, right? All we know is that we're hitting a major volatility event. This is major data coming in. We've got the PPI coming in tomorrow as well at the same time. So in 24 hours, exactly. And then the week, the day after that, uh, later on in the session, we have the, the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Report preliminary, right? Nothing too crazy overall. So again, just seeing some stuff here. Okay, yeah. No, I said, uh, no, no, this, the consumer report comes out of, hmm. sorry, later on in the week. I'm not waiting. I'm not going to stream for two days straight. I'll kill myself. So here we see the dollar breaking structure, breaking. Yes. We're getting very close to some major lows. You want to break down and make new lows. However, what else do we see? Well, we're getting extreme oversold levels on the dollar on the four hour, on the dollar currency index. The daily has plenty of room to run. This thing has been absolutely nuking. 
This is exactly why you don't trade news at data, though. We have been dumping off a cliff since last Friday, almost like people knew the data was coming back. So again, just keep that in mind. Oh, let me just look higher time frame as well. Oh, I mean, there there's a very big chance that people are starting like the 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 major accumulation adoption move is is probably underway right now. But between now and whenever, yeah, I mean, you have to. That's the problem. You want to crater a lot of the market first. Like you need to crater the altcoins. They haven't. A lot of them have been capitulated, but they haven't like been demolished yet. So overall, even on the daily time frame, even on the weekly, we can definitely go lower. Uh, we're very close to breaking new lows. Like I want this thing to just make a new low overall. That's amazing. And then markets opening up in an hour, even just, I already know everything's going to be gapping up. Yeah, everything's going to preliminarily gap up. So just keep that in mind. And, and like, like I said, with these news events, just because it was bullish for markets because inflation's going down doesn't mean price has to go up. It doesn't mean that at all. We're hitting sell pressure now on Bitcoin. If we start failing back wow. underneath structure, we're going to be looking to short. It's that simple. If that makes sense. So um, let me see. So just to, just to go back to this, because I wanted to see if anything was happening. Um, I'm going to go higher time frame. I'm to see it. There we go. Okay. So to kind of rehash what we talked about earlier, I'll get rid of this trash. Um, so in the, in the developing of the strategy and making sure you're setting rules and goals for yourself, the most important thing, like I said, it must be repeatable. If you're just doing something and you're magically winning, you're going to magically lose all your fucking money. Like it's going to happen. So it must be repeatable. If it's not repeatable, it's not a strategy. It's gambling. So the rules that I use for trading, and this is, again, I'm just going to hash them out because they're important. Risk reward must be a 41, four to one or higher your, your first profit target, right? Um, and the reason for that is that now I can get stopped out multiple times and still take the, take the position as long as my trade is not invalidated. The max capital risk at any time is 2%. What that means is, is that if I put my stop loss into profit, um, did I even match that in here? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, the next one. So max capital at risk at any time is 2%. And what that means is if my stop loss is in profit, I have no risk to my capital and I can enter other positions. So a position that's open with your stop loss and profit means that you don't have any capital at risk. Remember that. Uh, stop loss move to profit as soon as possible must be in profit by the second PT, right? So when you're planning your trade out as far as major levels, losing them. You're always targeting that first one as your first PT, but make sure you're actually setting good goals, like realistic goals. You don't want to, I would, I would mostly recommend people starting out trying to build that strategy system, essentially going way too constricting and like take too much profit early as they start learning how they like to trade, uh, how it works for them as far as a strategy. When planning the trades, I have at least three profit targets because I need to set goals for myself. I need to set goals for taking profit and I need to set, set goals for taking stop losses. I take profit at every profit target. For example, I take 25% at PT1. The reason for that is that I want to get paid. If I'm taking a good position that's going where, I'm, where it's supposed to go, you need to pay me. You need to pay me for making good decisions. The market needs to pay me for having good risk management and you know good price action trading. Leverage is not your friend. Respect it. The 10x works for me, right? Um, what that means is if you're capital at risk, right? We talk about the 2%. If you've got 20, if you got $2 out of your $100 that it's, that's that's uh, you know available and you only want to use $2 as a trade, but you can swack on 10x leverage. So now you got $20 exposure. Technically speaking, if you're in an isolated position, the max capital at risk is still $2. The value of your trade is $20, but your max capital exposure is 2%. So that type of stuff works. Uh, always, again, with that, make sure that your liquidation level, uh, if you're using higher leverage, is not 
above your stop loss. Like make sure that if you're taking like a higher leverage position that you're planning your trade, you're factoring that in. Because if you get liquidated um, before it hits your stop loss, that's 2% of your account just gone because you made a bad decision. Um, never cross margin. That's my rule. I never use that. Isolated or you risk exposing more than 2% of your capital. If you if you log into a new exchange, I promise you that they are all preset on uh, cross margin. The reason for that is that they want you trading more with higher amounts. That's their goal, essentially, is to get you to trade as much as possible at all times. So remember it. It's an important rule. And then finally, the trade is still valid if you're stopped out, but not if the price action invalidates it. If you're looking for a long, right, you're looking for that kind of like price to, you know, to bounce on your level and then continue, that's fine. But the moment price fails it, embarrassed to retest it and breaks new lows, you have now confirmed that that level is not valid. That long is not valid. Being stopped out should not be your invalidation level. If you're getting stopped out of your invalidation level, you're probably not targeting the right level overall. Um, you want to make sure the price action is uh, is going, you have the ability to stay in the position and the ability, it's essentially, even if there's some some market conditions that are not favorable to you, that if you get stopped out, it doesn't destroy everything. So just be mindful of that. So any questions on this stuff? I know we kind of jumped around there for a second because of all the data coming through, but anything? Yes, no? Cool. Um, let me just check. Uh, one of these brush strokes. No, oh, no, I'm going to keep that. Let's rename it. I'm going to keep it. And I'll get rid of those most recent horizontal rays because it don't matter. So any questions on that? If not, I'm just going to switch over real quick to uh, put it on comp, I believe. So talking about alts, and there's a lot of strategies that people go around and they talk about, oh, but is this going to work? What about this alt? So just wanted to touch up on alts because when we're trading long and short, and that's what the strategy just went through, right? The one I just explained, that's my rules for long long and short strategy, essentially, from higher and lower time frame. I use that to scalp. I use that to swing trade. Those are the general rules that I have. And I recommend people build their own table of stuff, what worked for me. I had post-it notes all around my computer until I burned it into my brain. So now I don't even think about it. I just do it. So looking at alts, right? This is just a little fundamental stuff on alts because I know a lot of people will look to invest in alts and everything like that. I will be heavily during the bull market, of course. Um, I have no problem making a 3X or 4X on my Bitcoin at the very least, but I also am greedy and I want to make more money on things that have a, a rapid chance of ex uh, expansion, right? My portfolio what doesn't change. I'm still, you know, more heavily allocated into Bitcoin and ETH than I am anything else, and Bitcoin specifically. Uh, but at the same time, alts are a good investment if you can pick the right ones. So how do you pick the right ones? So a little fundamental stuff. Again, this is going away from the technical analysis side. Does it solve a relevant problem? Right? Is it unique? The same thing is like. You know, if, if there's if there's multiple companies trying to do the same thing, it's not like some universal thing, right? Like there is Uniswap, but then there's also Polkadot and Sushi and all these different other swaps and stuff that have their own tokens. Uh, Uniswap's still the king, right? Everyone still uses it. Um, is it unique? Is it is is it solving a problem? Is it fixing something? Is it a layer like you know the Lightning Network stuff? Is there something essentially that it's making better where there was no more solutions? That's one of the biggest things. Uh, the team is the team public. Is it actually people or is it just a bunch of like pixelated gifs and memes of like you know Doctor Doolittle is is the CTO? Like I don't want to hear that. I don't want to invest in it because it's bullshit. Uh, is the branding level high? Are they able to build, you know, websites and market themselves as a successful company that solves problems? And again, does it have a use case? Is it usable? Is it user friendly? Is the UI good? Is the UX good? Uh, can big bag holders dump on me? That's a little bit harder to understand. For that, you really need to look into the token metrics. You can use stuff like uh, EtherScan as an example, since most alts will be on the ERC20 network. So what you can do is if you go to EtherScan, 
you can then look at the wallet that create that or the the address that created everything and you can look at the addresses that have large allocations of of the uh, of the coin so the teams and the investors are going to get the initial cut right but if those cuts are massive like i'm talking like over 50 60 70% and they all have it allocated understand that they can dump and probably will dump on you um, and then, of course, risk for scam. Mark, uh, risk for, is is there a risk that's a scam? Pepe Coin, Ben, Psyop, all these things that have come out in the last couple of months, uh, they're total scams, right? I still traded them. I traded I traded Pepe. I shorted the shit out of it when it got onto a futures exchange, uh, just because I know that these things are great for shorting once they actually get listed, right? Do I know it's a scam? Of course it has no value. It's Pepe. It's it's a meme. Now they just came out with Pepe 2.0. And there's still people that have lost everything buying the top on that thing. Or, you know, people have ton, made made money on it. Uh, and then, obviously, you got to look at the, the details. So if you look at um, coinmarketcap.com, you can look at the different projects. If they're not listed there, I'm, I'm Skep Market Cap. And their total supply versus circulating supply. Total supply is the total amount of coins. Circulating supply is like what is released to the public. And there, when there's a big disparity, like say total supply is, you know, maybe all, the circulating supply is only 20% of the token. Understand if it's only 20% of the token is circulating supply, that means that the, the coin value just based off of what the, the dollar amount that it is, let's say it's worth five bucks, it can easily be, if they release the total supply, it, it'll dilute by a factor of five. So it'll go down to being 20, like it'll go down from $5 to a dollar just if they release the total supply. And that's another factor to worry about. Things that are of total supply, circulating supply are very, they're very, very close. That's a good thing in my mind because then it means that, you know, it's it's more decentralized essentially, or even not if it's decentralized, it just means it's more accessible. So that means the actual value of the coin is more respective of what the total value of the coin is. So that's just a couple fundamental analysis stuff for me. Uh, anyone got any other suggestions to add to that little list? I'm always open. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I knew I was missing one. It's a very good point. So the vesting schedule, if you, well, what that means specifically is there are sometimes when you have ICOs, uh, you have essentially dates that are preset where people's coins will unlock. Or if you're staking, Right. If you if you put stake into like uh, what was it? Cake was a big one last bull run. Um, are there unlocked times? Like when are, are there unlocked periods that are based off of like at this date on this at this time on this date, this amount of the coin will unlock. Those are always great positions to be like, well, if it's unlocking here, I'm probably and if we're, and if we're in a downtrend in the market, like we're in a bear market and there's an unlocking. Do you think people are going to buy more or they're going to sell it? They're going to sell it. It's the same thing in a bull market. If people are real, people are still going to realize gains, but they're also going to accumulate more when more unlocks. So just be smart about it because vesting schedules and people missing out messes people up really badly. Um, I think that's about it. So we went over, what was it? Some fundamental analysis on alts. Um, and then obviously when the biggest thing was just talking about, uh, trade plan and all that stuff and all the rules that I use. Uh, again, you got to use what works for you. And uh, most people will, will, they'll throw stuff out if they start making money or they'll throw stuff out when they start losing money. Understand that there are days where you will lose all your trades and it happens. It happens to the best of us, right? The idea is that you're looking at this at a, ter a time like, you're, you're thinking about it in a long-term experience, right? You want to be trading from home. Trading from home is the best thing ever. I can I can get off the computer and, and do things, run errands and stuff if I need to. Be it might be help my kid, that type of stuff. The whole problem that people have is that they need to be rigorous and structured with the way they trade. And if you're not setting these kind of rules for yourself, same thing for entry conditions, right? Entry conditions. Those need to be solid as well. I want, you know, two or three confirmations from the Harmony and the, uh, you know, the, the retail stablecoin demand. I want to check the multi-dimensional volume delta, check the high time frame, make sure it's still, you know, what direction we're in as a trend. 
all of these things need to line up for me because if they don't, if I, if I have, you know, maybe out of like the five things I really look at, which is mostly some oscillator stuff and then obviously gain of level, right? Price action uh, or loss of level. These things need to line up for me to take a position. But what's my go rate? If, if I have five things, as an example, like the big things I look at, four of those five need to be true. There might be something that's an outlier, but as soon as you have a couple things saying one thing and another thing saying something else, and you know, it's a little bit all over the place, just wait for clarity. Because so many people will just blindly jump into positions thinking they're being smart and catching. Oh, I'm just going to catch. You know what? That was a bad trade last time. I'm just going to catch the top this time. No, just take a step back, reassess it, and and go from there. There's there's no reason to rush this stuff. And yeah, just trade on the four hour. It's so freaking easy when you look at the four hour structure. It's amazing. This range we've been in is awesome. And there you go. There's a perfect example of what happens when people trade the news, right? We came up to a level. Came up, tested up to the upside, and then fell back down. Where did we actually test structure-wise? Probably that. No, it even went higher. So was that 30? Yeah, so it was sold down by 31, essentially. It just failed lower and lower and lower. You're now bearishly diverging on the 15-minute. You've got multiple divergences all throughout early this morning and now. So are you seeing some some failure? Well, you're seeing some rejection, but not, not really failure yet. Again, if we see the trend change, you look to short it. And that's pretty much all it is to it. So you short the highs and you short the failures from the highs and long the uh, long the gains on the lows, and that's about all you can really do. I mean, even here, move back up, back down, three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars up, right? Or hundred dollars up and then down a couple of minutes, two hundred up and then down back three hundred. Now you're basing on structure essentially. So the big thing overall with this, like when you're looking at like an overall system that works for you, there's no one size fits all. Unfortunately, there's not like do this and you will make money. I have found that with my trading rules, with the stuff that I use for myself because it works for me. Right. I know that I'm not overexposed. I don't have to worry about high leverage positions. I don't have to worry about, you know, all these different things, uh, trading on the, the three minute and stuff like that. Cause you go crazy. So take some of this, build out some, add some, take some away. But the things I don't want you to change and kind of focus on is making sure you're not overexposing your capital. Don't be putting 10, 20, 30% of your capital in a single position because the risk alone means that you're potentially losing enough to where you're gonna, the next gain back, it might you might have to make 50% of your remaining account back just to be at break even. And that's always what gets to people. The loss, and I guess I'll leave this with like one last little thing, which is so this is something that's gotten me through a lot of stuff because a lot of people got, uh, I got wrecked really hard back in 2017, 2018. But not enough to where it like liquidated all my stuff. I just it took a massive hit. Um, the hardest thing for people to do, and this is a psychology aspect, which is you need to let go of losses. If you've lost money in the market, it is gone. It is never coming back magically. You're not going to win it back, especially if you're targeting that 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 you're putting a mental block on yourself that will keep you from trading. And I know good traders that have stopped trading because they've been psychologically damaged from the market. I knew a guy that was trying to long 59K to hold it up and then got essentially liquidated in the wreck in this move down back in uh, December of two years ago, December of 21. And he didn't know what to do with himself because he's like, but I don't understand. It was supposed to do this. It's like, no, failed, bearish retest of the high, down, back to the downside. And that he, he will probably not be able to trade again. I don't know if he is or isn't. I, don't, I haven't spoken to him in over a year. Um, and then also with your winners. Like if you have a good trade that hits your points, cool, great. Take your profit, close the position out, and then move on to the next thing and the next thing. Because at, at the end of the day, what you're trying not to do you're, you're trying not to get that rush and that feeling, which so many people get. It's like, oh, I just made, I just made five percent of my account. I just made seventeen hundred dollars on this one trade. Woo hoo! That's awesome. And now you get that emotional kick of like, oh, I'm on a hot streak, and all of a sudden you're freaking gambling. 
And it's the same thing as losing. Oh, I've lost three in a row. I suck. And maybe I should try something different. And now you're cycling through these things that are really bad for you. So when you're getting started and you're just trying to build something that's sustainable, I really recommend people stay on the four hour, stay high time frame with your trades, right? If you're trading on the four hour, you probably need like to keep a position open for a day or two, right? And what you're looking for essentially is just to, to limit the amount of exposure. Like when you're starting off, I recommend people to use the lowest amount of exposure possible. Even if you have like 10 grand in your account, you're like, I'm ready to do this thing. You need, first of all, paper trading is not effective uh, because there's no risk mentally. There's no risk you know, to how you're going to be trading. But what you should do is use like the lowest amount of money at the lowest amount of leverage that you could possibly use when you're learning how to trade, when you're building a system. Because it does two things really, really well. It teaches you not to give a shit about losing money or making money. It gets you over that hurdle of, oh, I had a, you know, a loss on my last trade or my last couple, or I made profit on my last couple because it's so minuscule. Because you don't need to focus on the dollar amount. The dollar amount comes if you focus on the percentages, right? If you're focusing on only two percent at risk, if focusing on not of like limiting your exposure. If you're doing those things, you're now training yourself not to give a shit emotionally. So when your account starts getting bigger because you're making good decisions and good trades based off of, you know, repeatable, a repeatable strategy, your account size will grow. You can increase your exposure because the moment you you start seeing price action and you feel that little adrenaline kick in your, kicking in and you start feeling a little like nervous and stuff like that, you're now losing the emotional game. You need to take a step back and, and de-risk because if you're emotional about your trading, you're going to lose your money in trading. It is that simple. Like the, that's, I mean, it's the same reason why the best traders are out there have like, um, what is it called? Uh, ASD, antisocial uh, disorder, antisocial personality disorders, right? Sociopathic tendencies, whatever the term is. I don't even know what the terminology is, but that's essentially you want to turn your emotions off play the levels, stick to your rules. Price must, we have to be here. We have to be overbought. We have to be this. We have to do all these different things. We have to, you know, auto charting. We have to be gaining a level. We have to be retesting something. Those rules are essentially are what make you a better trader. They, 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 you think they hinder you in the beginning, but like I would recommend picking four or five things that work for you, you know, four or five things that are important as far as, a structure, right? Four or five things that uh, that make you understand like the price action of what's actually going on. And from there, it's like, okay, we're bouncing at the level. We're pretty low on the oscillator, right? We're bouncing the level. We're pretty low on the oscillator. We're essentially trending to the upside. Do we have any liquidations getting grabbed? How about how about the delta? Are we showing anything impressive locally? Well, we've got, um, just zooming in, we've got some bearish volume out of position. We've got some bullish back tests of our major level. Hold of thirty of thirty k very strongly. We're bullishly back testing structure above. How about liquidations? Um, let me see if I can. Uh, I forgot the macro for it because I can't. See, actually, I'll just turn everything off. Right. How about my liquidation levels? Are we testing stuff? Are we going, do we grab liquidity? Yeah, we got a lot of liquidity. What about here? We got a lot of liquidity. We held some structure, bounce back to the upside. What do we do? Higher time frame, even based off of the, the previous stuff to the left of us, right? What do we do here? Create a low, create a higher low, continuation. Higher low, hold, continuation. Gain of level, continuation. Moving the upside, we create a high. We start to see some failure. We haven't lost the level. What's the level that, that it indicates the first potential loss? Daily open. What's the next one? July Q3. What's the next one? Probably the major gain that we had here, right? If we lose that, where are we going? Back to the weekly open. This is what you want to see tested. What's the invalidation? The invalidation is gaining back whatever you lost. That's the way you look at the market. We're trending now to the upside ever since last Thursday when we made the low, and then we had confirmation Monday morning with the higher low that can, that gained and continued. We're now at some highs. We haven't broken down anything. The trend is still up on the higher, on the, on the current time frame and on the higher time frame, right? Have we lost any major, we haven't lost any major levels. No, we're still holding structure. What happens if we bearishly retest structure? Going off a freaking cliff, 
Why? Because there's stuff down here to test. There's liquidity to grab. We should be failing here. We should be arcing straight down, essentially. Some of the other things that I use, I use uh, retail stablecoin demand quite often. That's one of my favorite. It's my favorite thing. It really is. And then I invert the chart, put on regular divergences. And there you go. Now I have essentially retail market psychology on, on the chart. Right? Very low, uh, uh, very high retail stablecoin demand, right? Green. Market moves up. Still going to the upside. Bearish divergences on 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 the uh, stablecoin demand. We're incredibly oversold. Am I just going to short the highs? No, because I'm probably going to get blasted out of the water like that. Like exactly what happened there. And then you get the failure. You get the secondary failure. The failure that moves down. The failure that retests swings and breaks structure and levels. Right? So at the end of the day, make sure you have these things on a list. Right? For me, it's retail stablecoin demand. I use the oscillator. I even use them together like that, just overlap on each other, just kind of see general direction, right? When we get very, very oversold and we're holding levels, I'm looking for bounces. Um, other thing, and then obviously the, uh, the multi-dimensional volume delta is great. You know, other things you can use as well. You can easily use uh, some of the indicators. Like what I usually do is I'll use the uh, the core signals, right? And I'll turn liquidations off because I've seen everything. Even having it just the bands on, right? So if I have this on here and then I put the bands on because the bands are essentially a combination, it shows the entire range in a nutshell. What else is it showing? So it shows that we're essentially contract, constricting because the bands are getting tighter and tighter. What does that tell you also? Is that we're potentially getting close to a breakout. What do you still, what's the local floor you're looking to hold? 29.9. What's the local ceiling you're failing at? 31, right? Over and over and over again. I have it preset right now just on, on scalp mode, but even on swing, um, I usually put the ATR filter on just to see what the general trend is. Probably we're up and then we broke it somewhere around here, probably around July Q3 when we failed that. I'd imagine the, the four hour trend broke. Yep. Yeah. So, Went down, we switched back bullish again. Why did we switch back bullish? Because we're gaining back levels, right? So the trend is up until we lose stuff and lose structure and lose trends. That's essentially the way I look at, at trading the market. And um, I'm going to also talk to Mr. Bing. So maybe we could set up something. I know he's in, he's in, uh, he's off traveling in Japan right now. Uh, but I think we can set up another botting session because a lot of people miss this miss this upside move and um yeah we didn't and, and that's a major major percentage move that a lot a lot of us are able to get and uh it's not fair i think if everyone's not able to get it as well uh the botting stuff is back on i've been back using it quite a bit pretty religiously because it takes your mind out of it and you can kind of focus on the things that work but when you see things right higher time frame was that obviously the, the floor of the move? Bullish divergence, gain of level, core signals goes long, we're gaining, gaining, gaining. Even here when we're maxed out, we see divergence, we see essentially an instant divergence, bearish divergence, and then we grind sideways for a while until now we're back on an uptrend. What do you want to see a failure of to go lower? You probably want to see a loss of the floor, loss of that 29.9 level essentially to go lower. And that's the way to look at the market. I have a couple of these things just written down. You know, if you got to do that, do it. Always continually take profit. Follow your rules that you're set out for. And um, yeah, uh, there's nothing really stopping you if you can do all those things. Any questions? I know I ranted there for a while, but. Ooh, I might actually get the nuke. Can you hear me? Was I just talking to myself for five minutes or 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. Unless there's, do you guys have any questions? Is there anything you want to clarify, want me to clarify specifically? So the volatility that kicked in now with the CPI, what's your, what's your take on it? How does it look to you? Well, I mean, it's it's good. It's good for what the markets are. But the problem is, is that I don't trade news events. I only expect increased volatility, right? 
Because at the end of the day, the actuals for all of these for the inflation was lower than expected, which is good. It's good. For, it's good, healthy for the economy, for the U.S. economy, the markets, everything. It's bad for the dollar. What's the dollar currency index doing? Freaking nuking. But are we breaking and making new lows? No, we are not. We are essentially in a flat bottom triangle with this whole thing, right? We're just kind of at this downside failure. We want to make new lows. We want to break structure down and continue that move to the downside. Some things that we can look at are things like, well, if it's on the four hour bottomed and now we should be gaining back up, right? If this, if the dollar currency index starts absolutely mooning, which it could, we want to see gains of things to go back to the upside. So if we, if the dollar currency index is gaining very sharp and strong, cause it's very, very, very oversold based on the harmony oscillator, right? Trend is down. Strength is, is massively down, right? You want to see a gain to, to essentially say, okay, if we gain here, gain 102, 101, 2, and start arcing back to the upside, you could be seeing a massive push down in the markets. You don't see the markets aren't open right now. Also, um, the stock market is not open. It's opens in 20, 30 minutes when we uh, do the, the live stream. So essentially, if that starts gaining, I'm probably expecting this thing to, to nuke to May if it does that. You know, but that's the whole reason why we hedge ourselves off. And we talked about that structure as that, that entire play as well, right? We talked about shorting 31 two. even if we break out above it, you short it as it fails back below. And it's been standing for quite a while, right? So those shorts are still in play and it's still valid. The trend right here is to the upside. And if we start breaking structure down, then we'll look for that continuation to the downside. But I think my opinion, if the dollar currency index starts pumping really hard as people in the stock market, even though inflation's going up, or excuse me, inflation uh, was was lower, less than it's expected, it doesn't mean the stock market has to go up. That's the craziest thing that people's like, but I don't understand. It's supposed to do this. Like, yeah, that's because the majority of people think that. The majority of the people, what do we know about trading? The majority is always wrong. And if the majority of the people see good inflation data, oh, we're going up. It's not. It's going to go the opposite. Have you, seen, <laughs> have you seen the daily on Nasdaq? QQQ looks pretty parabolic. Yeah. Breaking out the new levels. S NASDAQ, breaking out the new levels. Gain check, higher low. Tuesday, check, gain higher check low. The da- check the daily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it went from parabolic, essentially here locally, and then just went into like a straight line trend. But yeah, what's it also doing? What's it also doing now on a massive high time frame? Breaking out again. Well, it's breaking out again. But what is it? What is it doing as far as uh, the price in relation to price? The trend is up like that, and now we're making new highs. We're seeing some massive deviation. Yeah, if you scroll scroll out even further to see from the drag a little bit on the side, uh... it's been <laughs> up only. Yeah, it's been it's been up only since the lows in October and then January and everything the higher low in January and then it's gain and go, gain and go, and now it's got all these pockets that are untested locally, with almost the entire high being fully tested. So even on the monthly, at the weekly level, is there some freaking pretty awesome structure up here to test if we keep going up? Damn straight, there is. There's crazy stuff to test up here, like. Probably that. If I had to just pick something, that and the actual high of the the, the swing. Fav- That'd be a crazy test. Favorite uh, backwards end pattern of yours? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's essentially that's exactly yeah. what that is there, yeah. right? That's a, that's a great point. I never I don't talk about that as enough like I like I used to essentially, but that's what you get. I mean, that's on a weekly time frame that you see price breaking down. Right, price is breaking down, and bearishly retesting and going lower. All it is is going like this. 
right? Yeah. So we're looking for that test. That gain there takes you back to the highs and potentially new highs. It's very, very possible, right? But what else are we seeing on the weekly? On the daily, on everything, essentially. Yeah, the monthly, we got time to run, but it can do that forever. It can just go up and up and up and up forever. Even if it breaks back down, it can it can just deviate. Let me see if I got the, the actual index. Yeah, there you go. I mean, again, it's it's essentially even here, like on the monthly, you're at the highs of the previous level, right? You're at the highs that were the confirmation of failure back last spring where you failed it and you failed the levels to go lower. So can it continue? Absolutely. The trend is still up. But you start breaking some levels, man. You ever lose the June level, it is done. Done, done. It's going back there. It's going lower. And I don't think, like, with the interest rates being as high as they are and people not trusting the banks and, I think there's going to be a secondary bank crash in the latter half of the year, just going through some data data stuff. Especially since a lot of these smaller boutique banks are closing doors because people don't want to use them. Um, let's see. Is there anything else to go through? I think that's about it. Unless you guys got something for me. Okay, cool. I think we'll we'll stop it there and um if that's all good with everyone. Cool. Yeah, I, I mean, essentially, it's that was that was part of the. Uh, if you lose, it, it's it's essentially if you gain if you lose something and you gain it back, right? Because that's all all you're essentially doing is, if you gain if you lose levels and then gain them back, it doesn't invalidate the trade. The only thing that invalidates the trade is the loss of the level. In the bearish retest, essentially. I still have the data from last weekend in mind about uh, the dealers and intermediaries being heavily short. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it just makes me a little bit scared to long in this this range. Well, I mean, like I said. The range play is still valid. You still long the lows and you short the highs because at the end of the day, this is extra data, right? Like the price action is king and everything that we have from indicators to looking at stuff like this is is support, right? So if it's gaining levels, it's holding the low of the range, it's still very valid. And that's the big thing, essentially. As long as it's valid, it's good to go. Yeah, so these numbers came out here. Could be. It could be. I mean, even here, if you had some moves out, right, you had some shorts being closed, essentially, making profit, right, making three grand profit. Because the, the dealers, intermediaries, the brokers, the exchanges, they don't lose, right? They just don't do it. So. Of, of course, they have all the data. Exactly. Like, why? How do you think that? I mean, if you have an exchange, like, and you see everyone's positions, you literally know. I mean, that's why. It's, like, still to this day, it will never not blow my mind. Just thinking about how, you know, FTX and Alameda, how they were literally trading with with insider knowledge, and they were still losing money. They still lost all their money because all they were holding was shit coins, like. It is what it is. 
But yeah, that's what, the, the one thing that concerns me right now is that the asset managers institutionals are only long and have been for a long time. And um, you also have some stuff like open interest that's actually gone up quite a bit. So if I go back to the on-chain metric bundle and just look at open interest. Open interest is still at the highs, right? Another great tool. So yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna leave it there. I got like 15 minutes for the next stream, but uh, any any last minute things? Ah, uh, thank you, man. Well, nice thank you to, guys. Nice to hear your voice again in Discord. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. You mean the volume blocks? No, because the volume blocks are still valid because they're essentially showing levels based off of volume so they're going to be continually valid um i think l probably what you're talking about is like a look back that stops after time what i would recommend is lowering the, the order block sensitivity yeah so I, you're probably looking at alts right yeah. Well, it's, some alts, because of the amount of volume and volatility, it's going to be a lot less effective than just using the, the, the normal SR plotter. Because um, the SRs as well, I mean, the big thing that's easy with these is that people get confused also because they look at the different time frames. They're like, I don't understand. What is, what, what is the weekly? What is the daily? What's all this stuff? Well, you're essentially saying like that's a very local level 20 at 30.2, like daily based off of volume and, 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 and everything. So intraday, you know, like lower time frame. if you see a failure at a daily or a gain of the daily, you're seeing some price action changes. But as long as they line up with the bars, which they most of the time very much do. And then when you have weekly levels, right, those are higher time frame. That's like what you target four hour for big reversals or uh, three days or higher. When you have stuff up here, which is like all of the levels at 31, four, right? All of the major levels are there because these are the weekly level highs that you're looking back at a very, very high time frame. So essentially, if you break out of that, you're just going to continue. You're essentially breaking out. But it gives you lower local time frame levels to essentially target for, for testing and failure. If that makes sense. So again, does it tie in pretty damn close to the previous failure? Yeah. Are we potentially seeing a first one hour that gains above to go higher? Potentially, yeah. Right? Is retail stablecoin demand quite low? Yeah, but it's not bottomed by any means. Or topped, I guess, to have it inverted. We're just seeing essentially marking some local resistance so it helps plot stuff if you can't see it. You know, failing literally where it's supposed to fail. All of the major levels being in one place to the downside, where's the step off? You know, yeah, we gained all this this green structure here. What happens if we cross below the daily at twenty at thirty point three? We're probably going back to the weekly open for a nice little quick scalp and potentially to the low of the range because that's where you have structure. And it's all in re in relation to the time frame as well. So it's all kind of standardized in that sense. And they will change over time. Like that's the big thing is like they'll stay the same on the on the, whatever time frame you're on, but they'll change as price action occurs because new support resistance that's more local to price will come up. No, 
Yeah. So this is where you're looking at, at specifically at support and resistant levels based off of volume and volatility that you're seeing sell downs or buy ups essentially. So you're, it's, it's plotting the local important levels. So if you see gains of like, say the daily where we're at now, you're then looking to target higher because it's gaining structure. It's also, if you looked right to the left of it, it would be even on the 15 minute here, it'd be gaining the level, you know? So I'm still potentially gaining it. We'll see. Um, but that's it. I'm going to take a couple minutes and then I'll see you guys in the, uh, uh, the normal stream if you guys want to catch it and, uh, we'll go from there. But, uh, and thanks Eggle for saving it. That way everyone who came late can catch everything. Alrighty. Well, you guys, you guys have a good one and I'll, I'll try and talk to Bing and see if we can get a body session in. So we, people can start botting again. That'd be sweet. So, Alrighty, have a good one, guys. Take it easy. You